people! Welcome back, or welcome to Blue Dragon Art, where I, the self-proclaimed Blue Dragon, like to discuss different art-related topics from an indie artist's point of view. Before we start this video, if any of you stick around to the end, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Summer and Aradia zine. Our Aradia Magical Girl Collective is having a stream tomorrow, Thursday, June 13th, as well as Friday, June 14th. And we may also be extending that to the weekend, so stick around until the end of the video if you want to learn more about the Summer and Aradia free summer zine that we're working on. Now, back to the video. This week is my annual Pride Month celebration. So in the background, I'm working on one of my characters from Dark Horse, Chu Fong. What's Dark Horse, you say? Why, it's my free, not safe for work, post-apocalyptic, magical girl fantasy webcomic that you can read if you so desire, which, the link to that is in the description below. In the background, I'll be drawing, inking, and coloring Chu Fong all in time lapse. So let's dive in. Spoiler warning, this character has not yet appeared in the webcomic, so if you want a completely spoiler-free reading, then you might want to skip this video. Additionally, you're going to hear me struggling with the pronunciation of this character's name. Although, every time I've done a video on this character, I do pronounce it differently. This time around, I have been able to, at least online, in text, speak with someone who is from Hong Kong, who speaks Cantonese, is Chinese American, and they have been so kind as to give me some of their time to help me figure out the characters. I had the spelling correct, but I didn't have the correct characters chosen, so I'm going to go ahead and flash up how you spell Chufon on the screen, along with not only the romanization, but also the actual Chinese Cantonese characters that go along with her name. I am still mispronouncing the name, I am sure, so anyone out there who speaks Chinese, who speaks specifically Cantonese, because just as with the U.S., there are many different dialects and ways of speaking English in the U.S., and the same is true in China. I have to apologize for mispronunciation, specifically because with Chinese characters, if you pronounce something differently, it, it just like with, with many languages, it could be a completely different word, even though it's the same character. Or it might even, when you're speaking it verbally, you might be alluding to another character. So, another word, in, <laughs> in other words. So, I'm apologizing and that's why I'm taking this extra step to kind of add a disclaimer regarding her name. Because I, I don't speak Cantonese. I've never taken any Chinese courses. I know the stroke order of the characters because I learned some kanji in, when I took Japanese. Um, so stroke order is very important in both Chinese and Japanese. But I, I pronunciation, the languages are like completely different. They're, they're completely different languages. So I know I'm mispronouncing these Cantonese names. I had to give that warning. So Dark Horse is a comic that takes place, or rather begins, when I start telling the story in the late 1990s, 1999 to be exact. The story later moves forward to a world that we don't really recognize where the industrialized nations have all but collapsed. If you want to learn more about it, read the comic or watch some of my other videos. That's just kind of like the setup. Now, having said that, I chose to draw Chu Fon in 1990s fashion using this reference image, and you can check out that blog at the link down in the description. And I decided to do that because I wanted to. This is her in the mid-1990s, before she began bleaching her hair, so we're seeing her with her natural hair color. I don't know that she has anything wrong with her natural hair color, but as I'll go in more discussion later, she is a fan of fashion, and so she does a lot of different things with her hair. In most images that you see her in that I've drawn so far, what I've done is I've had her either magically or physically been bleaching her hair so that it appears blonde. She also wears contacts pre-war to make her eyes purple. And then after the war, once the face start integrating back in with the, you know, like the just regular humans, she finds a way to magically have her eyes purple because she wants to, because I said so. 
She loves fashion, she loves colors, and she secretly taught herself how to sew and make a variety of different clothing, including the outfit that she's wearing right here. This right here being the 90s, Jean is queen. So that's what she's wearing, that's what I picked. So the reason that I wanted to talk about Shu Fon for this year's Pride Month is it's been three years since I've really done a deep dive discussing her. And even then, I'm not so certain that I did a good job really focusing on her actual personality, which I'm gonna try to do an overview of in this video. And also since May was Asian American Pacific Islander month, but I thought it would dovetail nicely with Pride Month since this character actually is both of Asian descent and is Asian American, but also is, you know, part of the Pride community. Let's go ahead and jump into actually talking about this character. So, Ku Fong is a character who I've been working on for years. Like, seriously, her character has been evolving the more that I personally do research, the more people that I meet, the more people that I talk to or watch or listen to. It's it's been a goal of mine to really do my best to represent this character in as respectful of a way as I'm capable of doing. Obviously, I'm not gonna not slip up because you can only understand so much not walking in somebody else's shoes. But from, the out, from an outside perspective, it's my goal to not be disrespectful to her, which is why I've been talking to people, trying to figure out, you know, how her name should be written and pronounced, trying to learn from people of the trans community exactly what their experience is, but tailoring it for my story because totally different situation, things going down in my comic than what's going on in reality. And it's not going to be my goal to dwell on the bad things. I want to have a character who is just living her life. And so that's that's what Zhu Fong is doing. So for this reason, my video that was discussing her three years ago may have information in it that is going to be changed canonically because, you know, the more you learn, the more you want to make sure that you treat the character respectfully. She is her own character, and there are flares and things that I definitely want to have her embody, but I also want to do my best to try to listen to other people's actual lived experience whilst, you know, having her within the story, if all that makes sense. So, when it comes to her, she's actually one of the older quote unquote older human characters that we're going to be meeting in Dark Horse. Now, um, by old, I mean she was actually born in May of 1981. So she's really not that much older than the main characters, Kana and Rina, who were born in 1984. But, you know, she's a little bit older than them by the time that they meet her, which is going to be in the present day when we get there. Before the war, her parents were expecting her to either go to law school or business school, which she ends up choosing business school. Although, uh, let's see, if she was born in 1981, I'm not sure how many years of college, I I'd have to look up in my notes how many years of college she actually started it on. But that was what her life was going to be. She was going to be getting into business, which is not at all what she had a passion for. She was actually more inclined for the arts. Um, specifically, she loves fashion. And her eldest sister, she's the, she's the youngest of three, her eldest sister is the only person in the family who kind of recognized what Shu Feng wanted to do with her life. And before a traumatic event happens to her older sister that I'm not going to talk about in this video, she is also the only person with whom Shu Feng had confided in about her identity and how she identified. Her other sister, who is also older than her, as well as her parents and the majority of her family, like 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 most people in the story, passed away from the plague and or the war. So by the time we're meeting her, it's after she's lost her family. 
Although she has gained another family, and I'll talk about that a little later in the video. When we're talking about like her background, her grandparents, both sets, moved from Hong Kong to the U.S. Her paternal grandparents moved to the U.S. sometime before 1941, before the three year and eight month period, which was the uh, Japanese occupation of Hong Kong during World War II. Her maternal grandparents moved after that occupation, after three years, eight months. Both of her parents, both her mother and her father, were born in the United States, which makes her third generation Chinese American. I haven't really decided where in California they were born. I really need to do a little bit more research. I don't necessarily want to have her be born in San Francisco because I'm pretty sure that's that's where I had Rhiannon's parent, mother, I should say. Her mother was born in San Francisco. Um, I feel like I want to do a little bit more research before I pin that down, but this is just kind of giving you an idea of like the legwork that, which isn't really that much work, but some of the research and legwork that I go through to try to fill in the character's story is also thinking about like where their, where their parents are from, where their grandparents are from, etc, etc. So as third generation Chinese American, Ku Fong can understand Cantonese pretty much when it's spoken to her. She can speak a little bit, but not, not very much. And she knows and recognizes some characters, but really is not. She can't read or write it. She's not fluent in it. She only knows a little bit from just having been around people who speak it. So, uh, and I know a lot of families that are like that, not just like Chinese American, but like people who are like from Italy or, you know, other parts of Europe that come from like, maybe they, they spoke German and their kids, their kids can speak and understand what they're saying, but they might not necessarily know how to write the language or anything. You know, um, that's not that uncommon in my, my humble opinion. Probably has changed now, but remember, this is taking place in the 90s. It's um, a lot more accessible to learn another language, I feel, today. Although, who the hell has the time? I wish I could learn to speak Japanese and Spanish fluently. Uh, but I don't. I don't have the time. I really need to find the time. I need to make the time to find the time. Anyway, I digress. It's like a total, total tangent. And then to do with what we're talking about. So, after the war in the comic, which is the war between... In this case, the U.S. government and the faction. There's wars going on elsewhere in the world also, but we're focusing specifically on the Pacific Northwest and the U.S. in this part of the series. So after the war, Zhu Fong's only living relative, as I mentioned, was her eldest sister. Something that I'm not going to disclose in this video, traumatic happens to her, and she loses her oldest sister, who was you know, the one she was closest to anyhow, and the last of her remaining blood relatives that she knows of. And this is what elicits a strong emotional response in her, which those of you who have watched some of my videos know that that is important to people's powers awakening. And it also leads her to take on a new mission, and rather than, than seeking vengeance, which was her initial knee-jerk reaction of what she wanted to do, she instead decides to focus on helping provide a safe sanctuary for people who are in bad situations and need to get away from the violence, which obviously is going to be rampant in the world following the fall of any kind of law and order. So what she does, and I'll get, I don't want to talk too much about this in this video because it's its in spoiler territory and it's something that we'll, you know, get into. I probably will want to talk about in like maybe zine shorts or something like that that I do, but what she does is with the encouragement of her newfound family, a, a close friend of hers that she meets after the war, but before her sister passes, Nikki. She and Nikki pretty much become inseparable and are like sisters to one another. They both are, at this point, the only family that they have. And so it's Nikki's idea. You can learn more about Nikki in some of the videos that I've done talking about her, but it's her idea to encourage Xu Fong to start this theater company where she can 
express her art, but also use the bartering and proceeds and what, what whatever type of quote-unquote money system they come up with, whatever I write into the story, to help support a sanctuary for people who need, for women specifically, who need a safe place to get away or who don't have any family. And again, I'll talk more about it, but it's not just like these women are acting in the theater. It's kind of an interesting role reversal here because traditionally, quite often in a lot of not just Asian, but also even if you're talking about Shakespeare's England, you know, men would oftentimes play women's roles in theater, in Peking theater, in uh, Japanese kabuki. Is it kabuki? Did I say that right? Uh, and as I was mentioning, also in Shakespearean theater. This, for me, I thought would be kind of cool to have that reversed in that the women are playing all the roles and in some cases will be the ones playing the, the male characters in whatever productions or shows that they put on. But in addition to like being a theater group, these women have formed a pretty close-knit community where they're farming, they're learning how to, how to barter and trade, they're building, they're essentially reconstructing and making their own little part of this community in a country that has essentially fallen from its industrialized background. They're picking up the pieces and working together and supporting and caring for one another. That's something that I think is important about this character because her love for her older sister, that was such a strong bond that instead of seeking out revenge, she decides to put something positive out in the world. Not to say that I'm not going to have, you know, that, that element that I'm not discussing kind of come back into the story later, but instead of to go and seek blood for what happened to her sister, provide an opportunity for it to not to, for it to be less likely to happen again, I suppose, is what I should say. Um, focusing on the positive, being a pillar of support, and helping people kind of come together and rebuild out of the ashes of devastation. Personality-wise, I'm hoping to get a chance to show once she lets her guard down. When we first meet her, she's going to be a little, a little bit um, more closed off and not letting people see past her shell. But once we get to know her, some of my goals is to kind of show that she loves playing games, card games in particular, but solving puzzles, navigating problems, expressing herself through her art and fashion. And while she's not got a deep understanding or knowledge of, you know, what life was like in Hong Kong for her ancestors, she is definitely interested in her culture and her background and she finds her own ways of expressing that love through her own interpretation of fashion, some that are influenced by Chinese traditional clothing, but with twists of her own personality included in it. So I'm really excited to begin working on Time Warp, which is what I was talking about last week. Once I'm done with this part of the revamp, I actually get to start drawing new pages of Dark Horse and actually pulling us into the present day so that we can start meeting characters like Trufon, Nikki, Oshin, we're finally going to get, I keep teasing about Oshin, but he's finally going to be in it. And I'm really excited to actually put these characters to paper and have them come to life in the story. It's it's one of my main goals and I'm super excited for that. And I wanted to kind of get into a little bit of Shu Fong's evolution as a character. I wanted to go into more detail about why I started writing her, which, you know, has ties to my Fushigi Yugi fandom when I was in college, which Fushigi Yugi, if you don't know, was actually set in ancient China. You know, there were ties regarding like the first time I met people from China. My dad was working for a company and you know, that, that family was very kind. And to this day, I appreciate and respect them. And in addition to that, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about my reasons for incorporating the T into the LGBTQ plus community with this character. 
but I, I feel like I should maybe save that for another video for another time since I specifically wanted to focus on who she was in this video, what her personality was, what her background was. So I'm gonna go ahead and close by thanking the person in my collective who was my contact and, and helped me like on the spur of the moment kind of figure out the pronunciation as close as I can get it for Zhu Feng. Her last name I'm not going to get into right now because we're st I'm, I'm still waiting to find out how that is supposed to be pronounced. If anybody knows in the comments who speak Cantonese, please let me know. But thank you if you happen to watch this video, which I don't think they watch my videos, but if, you, if you're out there watching this and you want me to give you credit and link your comic, your webcomic, let me know. I'm happy to do that because... I'll probably do that in the future anyway because I read the comic anyhow. But 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 if you want if you want credit, let me know and I will certainly give you credit, give you a shout out. Happy Pride Month everyone. Thanks for watching. Don't forget if you're interested in Aradia Magical Girl Collective streaming, it is for sure going to be tomorrow, Thursday on Twitch. We're streaming comic pages, artwork, illustrations. We're doing it again on Friday. There's going to be a different artist each day, I think. And I'm going to be the moderator over there just in the comments. Yeah, don't miss it. The link to the Twitch channel is down in the description. We're giving sneak peeks for the free Summer in Aradia zine that the collective is working on. This one is not kickstarted. This one's going to be free to the public. Anyone can read it. It's going to be rated, I think, PG-13 or something like that. So yeah, if you're interested in that, Twitch link is down in the description. I'm Blue Dragon. I'm signing off now. Peace and love. Fare you well. And keep on trucking. <laughs>